Welcome to The Mischief. I'm Valen, and this is Thermal Expansion. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the next level of different machines, dynamos, and other items. So in previous parts of this series, I have talked about what I was calling a early tier or tier one because they do not require any kind of alloys and therefore can be crafted with just regular ores and things found in the world. Now, the next tier requires some kind of alloy, meaning like Electrum or Signalum, uh, which will require an already existing machine be made, uh, most likely from thermal expansion, uh, in order to create those. Uh, specifically, in this case, I'm talking about a pulverizer where you can take a couple different ores together uh, after they've been uh, crushed and then make some of these alloys. Now I'm going to start off with these, give you a brief description of each different item, telling you some of the benefits of each and how they're generally used. But I'm not finishing uh, covering this mod with this uh, spotlight. I will be going into a little bit more detail in at least one more episode. So to start off with, we have an igneous extruder. Uh, the recipe for this one is piston, machine block, you know, you've got invar as your uh, alloy here, plus redstone reception coil and some glass. It's not too bad. None of these machines really are that expensive. But uh, this one, those that are not familiar with it, it will use a little bit of power uh, as well as some water and lava. And in this case, I have a fluid duct, which is not part of the uh, thermal expansion mod, but part of thermal dynamics, uh, which is a very highly recommended add-on mod for this. Now, in this case, it, I'm just piping in some of this. Uh, if I take my crescent hammer and I right click to change these to output, I currently have these already set to be input on both the top and side. And you can see now we have four buckets of water and lava on either one. Plus we can see the visual changes in the tanks that are supplying this. Now all we need is a little bit of power. I'm going to put an energy cell in here just to provide some. And you can see the power is going in. And it is currently providing for us cobblestone. This is one of the three uses for an igneous extruder. Now, besides this, if you notice on here that there is no change, if I shift uh, so that you can see in the top left there, there's 13 buckets of water, 16 buckets of lava, nothing really big there, no big deal, right? So if we change it to stone, and of course it's going to stop because it only has one output slot, I remove this and it starts making the stone. You'll notice that 16 buckets of lava is still the same, but the water is actually going down it will start consuming water, so an aqueous accumulator is most likely going to be needed in this case. Uh, now, if I switch it over to obsidian, things are going to change even further. I remove that. It will start making it uh, rather slowly once I remove all of them there. Uh, and then you'll notice that not just the water, but both the lava and water are being consumed in this case. So there is uh, three different stages, three different items here. Uh, basically the stone will have an ac added cost of water, but that can easily be offset with an infinite water source and an aqueous accumulator tossed in between there. Uh, but otherwise your obsidian will eat up lava. Now there are ways of producing lava in this at the cost of power, but uh, currently just know that there are certain restrictions on this. Moving on to the next one, we've got a glacial precipitator. It's similar in function. Let me grab this energy cell back that we're going to be needing. And when you craft this up, your glacial precipitator, it is made with invar, copper gears, redstone reception coil, machine frame, and a piston. So it's very similar in uh, uh, you know scope and shape how it's made. But when you place it down, it's it actually will start <laughs> with four snowballs in it. Which, which is kind of cool. Uh, I mean, it's made to make snowballs, snow, and ice uh, at the cost of water and power. Now let's of course put some power in there while that's powering up. I'm going to take my crescent hammer and uh, start having this thing make us some snowballs. And you can see that the water is going down as it makes us the snowball. Uh, it is currently being used up just a little bit at a time. Not much, uh, but if I switched over to snow, it's going to be a little bit. Going to use up some of the water there as before. You can see it is currently eating up some of the water for that. And of course, we've got ice, which is going to eat up the uh, the water reserves as well. All three are going to eat up water, so an aqueous accumulator will work out just fine. You just need a little bit of uh, power in order for this to actually work. And of course, as you can see, I currently had it set to input at the top. Nothing really big. You can always disable it, and no augments are standard for it. But moving on, we have the centrifugal separator. The centrifugal separator recipe is... A compass, machine frame, some constant tan, and some copper gears and redstone reception coil. I think the 
let's say I made an alloy. Um, in this case, let's say a uh, electrum. And typically, an electrum alloy is made in a thermal foundation setup with some pulverized silver and some pulverized gold, uh, typically from a pulverizer, of course. And I made that electrum and realized, oh no, I didn't actually want that. I needed the gold back. Um, well, in that, in that case, I could feasibly put this in here, uh, grab my uh, power or energy cell that I, I intended on putting in here, now you won't need any kind of liquids. You'll probably notice on the side here that it does have a tank output. That's, in some cases, you might actually get a liquid output. Uh, and if I put this electrum blend in here, nothing's going to happen. Specifically because electrum requires multiple parts. If you look at the recipe for it, one silver and one, uh, or one silver and one gold, right? So you need at least two parts in order to extract these because therefore it will generate the exact ingredients used to create it. So this is a way of separating your blends uh, that you might possibly want. Therefore I now have gold and silver back. So if I have electrum I could feasibly pulverize it into a dust. I could then toss it into the centrifugal separator and I could uh, perchance turn it in back into pulverized gold and then resmelt that into individual ingots or other nuggets as you will. Now another example, toss in here in Derium blend. Of course it isn't going to work unless I have more of them. Just something to keep in mind here, you're going to need at least enough in order to make one crafting recipe of it. And in this case you're going to get four items plus you're going to get an output of a liquid on the side. So there we go, we now have uh, two pulverized tin, a pulverized silver, pulverized platinum, and one bucket of ender. So this is kind of a way of backwards crafting so that you can get specific materials. Uh, maybe you found some uh, enderium uh, ingots in a chest and you, you really needed the platinum for something else. This is a really good method of doing it, but it's not just for that. You can use it for uh, creating other things like, uh, you know, changing your concretes into like uh, the sand and uh, gravel as well as uh, backporting a lot of your blends. And here we have the magma crucible. There are probably many that are very familiar with this one. The magma crucible is made with a redstone a conductance coil, reception coil, machine frame, invar gears, and nether bricks. Magma crucible, if you click on here, as before, uh, any of these should typically have an area that you can click a recipe in the glacial precipitator, igneous extruder, they don't have them. The centrifugal separator, you just click on the arrow to see the recipes. In the magma crucible, you just click on this little area here, and it shows that you can take solids, turn them into liquids, it, in most cases, at the cost, typically, of power. So there are some restrictions on this. I mean, you, of course, can do, uh, let's grab just some regular, a piece of cobblestone. I throw this in here, it's going to slowly, very, very slowly, unless you augment it uh, with upgrades and such, start turning this into a bucket of lava at a very high cost of power, more than this could even hold in its internal reservoir. If you use something else like netherrack, it will be much cheaper. Uh, and a magma block will be cheaper as well. You can see here magma blocks can be turned into a bucket of lava at the cost of 40,000 RF. Now if I also use this with something else like netherrack, it will cost me 60,000 RF. And if I use that for something like cobblestone, it will cost me 300,000 RF. It just takes a lot more to actually do that. But this is just uh, giving you an example of the different things you can use to just make lava. Now, of course, you can make like snowballs into water. You can take some resonant, uh, resonant end stone, turn it into resonant ender. Uh, you can take your destabilized redstone or turn it into destabilized redstone. There's a lot of different things. Your, your uh, energized stone and glowstone can be turned into energized glowstone, regular redstone into destabilized redstone, etc. Uh, it can have a lot of uses, be very useful. Uh, you might even be able to uh, turn it into a power production facility if you properly work it. But uh, it is one way of making those liquids from solids. Next up we have the compactor. The compactor is made with a piston, some bronze ingots, copper gears, res redstone reception coils, and machine frame. Now the compactor has multiple uses. It can be used, as you can see here, in two different modes. Uh, one mode is pressing, the other is storage. If 
I click on here, you can see that there are different uh, ways of choosing this. Uh, by putting in ingots, it will turn them into plates. By putting in, uh, you know, nuggets or something like that, we'll turn them into ingots. Uh, it will also compact things into others, like putting in ingots. It will turn then turn them into blocks. So it is a way of storing things as well as converting them in some ways. Uh, so, for instance, if I put this gold nugget in here, nine gold nuggets will equal one gold ingot. And then I could take nine gold ingots, put them in there, it'll turn them into those. It'll be, of course, at the cost of power. Uh, it's not too bad. It's pretty good, and you just change the mode that it converts these, so I can then take the gold, put it back in here, and it will, much slower and much more power intense, uh, create a gold plate. As you see there, one gold plate, done. Now we have an induction smelter. Induction smelter, it, it looks a bit confusing at first. Uh, let me grab both of these here. I've got a bunch of gold ore, and they were in both slots for a reason. Of course, you've got your different, you know, inputs, outputs you can do on this. But you see the flux slot unlock. Just ignore this area for the moment and think of it this way. It is a way of replacing, but not entirely, your pulverizer setup. Now, the pulverizer, of course, you put in some ore or something like that, ore or whatever you've got, and it will typically give you a, a good output of some kind of reduced material or an increase in material, depending upon what you put in there, and a secondary output chance. Now, an induction smelter will actually do a little bit better than that, but make use of the pulverizer. Now, if I click on here, you'll see that there is uh, sand, for instance. If I add sand in with gold ore, I will get two gold ingots plus a percentage chance of getting rich slag. Whereas before, with a pulverizer, I would have two percent, or I would get two pulverized gold and I would get a 5% chance of cinnabar. So you get a little bit different of uh, potential uh, you know, outputs there, but you also, instead of getting to pulverized gold, you, in this case, would get gold ingots. So they're already smelted up, so it's a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient, and you can use the secondary outputs to also gain other things. Use for this, you can use it to make different phyto grows, uh, which are advanced versions of fertilizer, specifically for the use in thermal expansion. Uh, the induction smelter itself uh, also has potential to take use of this. Now, of course, you can also take some nickel ingots and some pulverized, uh, you know, items or, you know, ingots and grit and still make the uh, alloys with them. Uh, so this is kind of a multi-use, but you can also do other things like take some lead shears and some sand and you can get your lead ingots back. So it's similar to a pulverizer in that aspect, but you can also get better or different secondary outputs just from using this. Now, to further explain this, of course, you have two input slots, and of course, one input slot is going to be for sand. Well, if I put these in here like so, or if I have this just being fed in, of course, it's just going to keep feeding in until these are both full. Now, if I take these out and I click this button here, flux slot locked. That means that one of these slots is going to be reserved for the secondary use item. And by that, I mean flux items, sand, some rich slag or regular slag, etc. Those items included are sand, soul sand, cinnabar, perothium dust, or rich slag, and the like. So therefore, you'll have flux items reserved for this spot. So if I try putting this in here, it won't let me, but I can drop it into the side here. Now, if I decide to turn this on, which in this case I have a uh, lever on the back, there we go, the, this will start dropping the sand in and it will actually have these go into the respective slots. So if you have it being pushed or pulled into your induction smelter, you can now reserve this spot for specifically flux items that will allow you to process these together to make your gold uh, ingots or whatever it is that you're trying to create and therefore allow that to work as intended. Or you could just turn it off and you can just try and, you know, use it without said items. In some cases, you're just wanting to make alloys and so on. All right, and next up here, we have a thermal mediator. Thermal mediator is a device, so therefore you cannot upgrade it. Uh, it requires a block of copper, a couple of invar ingots, a device frame, redstone servo, and two tin gears. So it's a little bit different in its uh, make and creation, and it does not use power. You notice there's no power thing on here, and it does say cools down adjacent blocks, improving their speed. So what can you put in here? Well, I, I, I don't know. It, it, there's no nothing to click. So right, I've got JEI in, included here. I can just hit the letter U, and it will tell me what it can be used for. Gelid cryothium and water. Each one will have a different result. 
60% or a 20% increase in its, uh, well, output. Uh, in this case, if you look here, it says cools down adjacent blocks, improving their speed. So this block here, the phytogenic insulator, and this block here, the induction smelter, will both have an increase in speed while this is working. So allow me to pump some water into it. And what that'll do is it will allow it to start cooling blocks that are adjacent to it on its flat side. So if I have a block here, it's not going to take advantage of it. It's only the ones that are like on its uh, uh, flat sides. So feasibly, if I wanted to hide this, I could have water being pumped into it and it being underneath these blocks to help increase their uh, their speed, as it were. And it doesn't work on everything. For instance, I could try putting this next to an arboreal extractor. It doesn't work with that. It will work with most machines, though, uh, those that require some kind of power. As an arboreal extractor does not, it will not. But uh, over time, it will use water up. So you are going to need to pump that into there in order for it to actually uh, continue to uh, cool the nearby machines. But of course, that can easily be uh, fixed with a uh, aqueous accumulator, as you see here. Now for the phytogenic insulator. It sounds very confusing. It looks very confusing, but in simplest terms, this machine here is used for growing plants and trees without actually placing them in the world. So it's, uh, for those familiar with immersive engineering, it is similar to a garden cloche, but it is for thermal expansion. All right, here we go. I'm going to power this thing up. And then it works in a, a strange way at first. When you first look at it, you're like, wait, lily pads? Don't look at the lily pads. We're not worried about lily pads. Here's something a little bit more standard here. We've got potatoes and rich phyto grow. Uh, actually here, potatoes and phyto grow. So you basically need two items in here, some kind of food or vegetation in most cases, uh, and some kind of fertilizer in the form of phyto grow, rich phyto grow, or fluxed phyto grow at this point. Now, if I put a potato and some phyto grow in there, it will then start using some of the water that is being pumped into it. Yes, you will need to pump some water into it, and it will start producing an output. Now, in this case, let me grab some potatoes, and we will put these in here, as well as phyto grow. Uh, we have some regular phyto grow here, and I'll put that in, and then we just need a little bit of water. So let me just right click, fills up, and it will slowly start working. And you'll see that it has like a, a different use for this. Uh, each time that it produces one, like that, you'll see it used one potato, one phyto grow, and made three from it. You have a possible secondary byproduct in some cases. And you can also lock the fertilizer slot. It's just like the... Uh, induction smelter here with the uh, flux slot locking, uh, you can actually do that in this case as well. Now I already have potatoes there. Once I take them out, I can't put them back in because I would need to switch them around. And this is so you can have the uh, phyto grow being pumped in, whether it be uh, phyto grow, rich phyto grow, or flux. Now, of course, just to give you an idea, phyto grow is made with sawdust, typically from wood, uh, your niter or nitrate dust, depending upon, you know, I've got other mods installed right now. And then, of course, some kind of slag, or you've got a secondary way of making it with uh, niter, pulverized charcoal, and slag. So you have multiple different options in order to start doing this. And you can see that it is currently generating much more potatoes. Now, with the proper upgrades, uh, you can always augment this even further. Uh, if you look here, you can make a uh, different, like, mushroom farm. You can make a uh, nether wart, uh, ender chorus plants as well as uh, you could turn it into a tree farm even and you don't have to place a single tree into the world it just has to uh, have phyto grow being pumped into it as well as the different saplings these are with different upgrades that you would need to add into this and you would need to upgrade this uh, phytogenic insulator as well so now that you understand a little bit better hopefully it's not too complex for you to, to really understand what it is but it does require phyto grow power and water so it's not just uh, as simple as some of the other machines. A fluid transposer. This one here is very complex machine. All right, so you put the bucket of water in, you tell it to empty that bucket, and it will slowly empty the bucket into the machine. And, and, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> then you can pump this, uh, this liquid out and uh, into something else. Now, it's not always just buckets. It, it can be other things as well. You can use it for uh, uh, doing the reverse. Now, you saw me uh, empty that just by switching this here. I can also fill that. So I put the bucket here at the input. 
It then takes a second to fill that, and it says it's locked because it's currently filling the bucket, so it's not going to let you do anything until it's done. Then it took the water back, and the water, the bucket is full. So you can use it to fill or empty uh, fluids, as you can see here on the top tabs, like putting a cactus in will get you some water. Uh, but you can also use it for upgrades on some of the uh, ductwork for thermal dynamics. Uh, you can use it to fill florbs, which is a way to throw a liquid. You can use it to change block types like cobblestone into moss stone. Uh, you can make some of those viaducts, viaducts, which are the things that I was uh, whooshing around between uh, different areas in the previous videos of the uh, thermal expansion. You're either infusing something with a liquid, removing a liquid from something, or filling a fluid into something. So that's the basic idea. You can use this with tanks. You can use this with all sorts of stuff. You can use it just to empty stuff out, uh, liquids out, and pump it elsewhere that you need to. And it's, it's very useful. It just needs some power and the items that you're going to be doing this with. And the recipe for the fluid transposer is simply a machine frame bucket, redstone reception coil, and in-bar gear with some glass. An energetic infuser. This one here is made with a redstone conductance coil, two redstone transmission coils, a redstone reception coil, and two copper gears in a machine frame. It's a little bit more microcrafting than, than the other ones, but it, it's still rather useful. Energetic infuser is one way of, as it says here, infusing energy into compatible items. If I take, uh, let's grab some other flux capacitors. Let's grab this empty one here, and I put this at the input. It is then just going to start absorbing the power that is already stored in it into itself. And that's this is how it works. It's used for charging tools and items or blocks or whatever. Uh, I could use it to uh, charge up that, um, where did I put that, this energy cell here instead. I could put that in there. And you can see that the power is being filled in, but I could also uh, pull that power back out. It, of course, it's got 1.18 million, so you're not even seeing that, but you are seeing the power drain because the numbers don't go that low. Once it's done draining that, it will then just jump over to the output. So it's just useful for a lot of things. You can always click on the lightning bolt here to see what the different uses are. But most importantly, if you want to upgrade your rich phytogrow into fluxed phytogrow, that's the way you do it. You infuse it with power. And then, of course, we have, as I've been using, the energy cell. The energy cell is made in a specific way, and that is with a, a block of redstone around an energy cell frame with some lead ingots and a redstone conductance coil, which the energy cell frame is made with iron ingots, lead gear, and glass. So there's a little bit different crafting mechanic involved in that. Now the advantage of energy cells over just like having these things connected is that, of course, it can store a lot of energy. I mean, just it alone can hold 2 million RF. Uh, now you can also upgrade this further so it can hold more, but when you click on it, you can also transfer from it and into it uh, up to 1,000 RF per tick on its basic setting. Of course, you can upgrade this so that it can do a lot more. It has advantages with how it interacts with the world. It's the configuration. Of course, you hit Shift-Click to clear all these. You've got your inputs, and then of course you can change it to output. And it can accept power and push power out. It's just a battery, really. But you can pick it up. It will store its amount in it, uh, like this one here. You know, it's got different amounts in it. And then you can move it elsewhere, use it as you like. Or, as you saw, you can use it as a battery to charge things with. And you can use it to uh, pull things back out with like things like an energetic infuser. Now... The three dynamos that I have that require alloys, the magmatic dynamo is probably your most basic. There's a missing spot here, but if you click, it says show recipes. You've got two different options right now, lava and blazing pyrothium. Lava will generate 120,000 RF. Blazing pyrothium will generate 2 million, but of course this requires more complex materials in order to make it namely pyrothium dust. Uh, but a magmatic dynamo will, of course, get you, you know, your standard 40 RF per tick unless it's been upgraded, and it generates the, the redstone flux from it. So if I take a bucket of lava and I just kind of right-click on it, uh, then it will start doing the thing. You know, it, it just makes power, and then you can you know, have power coming off of that, which is very, very useful. It's very simple. Um, the recipe for it is going to be invar, iron ingots, redstone transmission coil, and a redstone. So it does require a uh, an alloy in there, but it is still rather basic. Now we've got an innervation dynamo. This one here, it's a little bit different. It will take power, 
and push power into it. It's, it's actually very similar to an energetic infuser. Uh, the recipe for it is uh, some iron ingots, resin transmission coil, electrum gears, and redstone. Uh, it currently has other uses though, and that primarily, or at least for early game, is going to be uh, using redstone for power. So you could just drop a piece of redstone in there, there we go, throw that in there, and it will start generating some power from it. So that that's pretty cool, right? I mean, it, it's not too bad. You get 64,000 RF from one piece of redstone, so it can be a good temporary source, uh, but you can also use other things like energy cells uh, or flux ca uh, capacitors in order to fill it and push power into it as well. And then we've got the numismatic dynamo. This one's a little bit more interesting. Uh, this one here has an input, and it will also produce power from items in a way. Um, one is from coins, which can only be produced from a compactor with a compactor mint augment installed, which will then turn uh, most primarily metals into uh, coins. But um, the idea here is that otherwise you'd have to insert emeralds and you can get power from it. But it's basically you're, you're using ores to generate power in most cases. You're converting them into coins and then converting them into power from there. But otherwise, you can always use emeralds as a power source. It's very expensive, but it can be very powerful. Of course, all of these can be upgraded as well as uh, any of the machines, not the devices, but any of the machines that you see here, which are pretty much, uh, and the energy cells can be upgraded. Uh, but before I get into the upgrades, I am going to say that there is a drawback for most dynamos as compared to an energy cell. Now, before you saw that you could do inputs and outputs for energy cells. Well, dynamos, they pretty much output to the red point on there. And you can see this one here, it's still trying to generate power from the lava that it has. So if I put a machine that has some space for power in it on top of this, you'll see that it will instantly start pushing things in there because it was currently still trying to generate power. But if I have power in this dynamo and I put a machine on top, you'll notice that the power does not increase. It won't do that until it has more item, more some, something else in there starting to generate power. It will then have to start doing that in order for it to start pushing power out. So that can be very, uh, well, difficult. Now, if I put this up here, I can then just tell this energy cell to output up to the top. So that is a very good reason to actually have energy cells uh, along with your dynamos so that they can uh, store the power and then push it back out. All right, next thing we're just going to get into a little bit of an upgrade. I am not going to get into augments in this video. That's going to be a future one, perhaps. Uh, but I have here a whole bunch of pulverizers. They all have 20,000 RF in them. If you look here, 20,000, that's maximum. This one, 20,000 out of 30,000, it has been upgraded to a hardened version, which uh, to upgrade these, it's, you know, invar plus bronze gear, redstone, and you just right click on the block and it will then gain these little like uh, kind of grayish corners on there. Now if I want to go from an invar or a hardened to a reinforced version, I then need to make the next stage and then click on the invar version and it will upgrade it. Uh, and then so on, click on the yellow to make the orange one and etc etc. And each one of these, hardened upgrade kit, reinforced, Signalum and Resonant. They go in that order. Now the Reinforced is going to be Electrum and Silver. The Signalum is going to be Signalum and Electrum with some Cryothium. And your Resonant is going to be Enderium and Lumium with some Pyrothium. So it, it, they're not exactly the cheapest to upgrade, but once you do, you will gain several different benefits. Uh, allow me to demonstrate what those are. To start with, you already noticed that there's uh, increased capacity for power. By the time I'm at the end, it's up to 60,000 from its base 20,000. On top of that, you will start gaining access to augmentation slots. With the first upgrade, you get one, the second you get two, third you get three, and the last one you get four augmentations, which can be wonderful for improving the performance or even abilities that your machines can do. Your power usage is actually gonna go up as you increase. And just to give you an, an example, I did have 20,000 RF in this one. I had 32 iron ore and I got 10 pulverized. And I did the same thing with the uh, basic model. I did get the, uh, the basic on there. 
it did end up giving you the exact same amount of uh, results. Of course, there's a possibility for a secondary outcome. I didn't get it in either case for those ones, but they should use them. It's just a matter of if you have a large power drain on one machine, it will make uh, the rest of your machines start to struggle. And then, of course, if you have a basic one and you have a lot of materials and you're ready to upgrade a whole bunch of machines, you might want to just ignore upgrading one, two, three, four. Instead, you might want to go for these conversion kits. Now there's only three because they're intended on upgrading things uh, completely. Basically you're going to be upgrading a uh, reinforced conversion kit. It's going to just change something up straight up from its basic level up to a reinforced conversion kit. Now there isn't a um, what's called a hardened version because all you need is the hardened upgrade kit for that. But a conversion kit will just jump all the way to whatever the level is. So you don't need to upgrade one and then the other and then the other. So for instance, this is a basic model. If I take a signal and conversion kit, it then just upgrades it straight to it. If I try a resonant conversion kit, it will upgrade straight past that as well. Uh, I can upgrade each one of these to the highest tier if I so desire uh, just by using that conversion kit. But each one is going to be a little bit more expensive than the next. Um, of course, you're, they will basically just require your previous levels of uh, upgrade, so there's no real difference. It's just a matter of if you craft it, then you don't need to like take it out of your inventory, fill up your inventory with a bunch of stuff on the way over to upgrading a bunch of machines. You can just carry a bunch of resident conversion kits. So they're just another way of doing it, really. And then to give you an idea of some of the conversions, this one here, your uh, energy cell will store 2 million for a basic one with a possible maximum input output of 1,000 RF per tick. Once you've upgraded it to a resonant version, it can uh, in and out 25,000 RF per tick, and it can store up to 50,000 RF, just to give you an example for comparison on those. So I hope you guys enjoyed this bit by bit on thermal expansion and some of its more uh, middle to end tier items. I will be uh, looking forward to doing a little bit more on this mod as time progresses. So if you did enjoy, please be sure to give a like, comment, subscribe, and as always, spread the mischief to others. I think they'll enjoy this content too. And until next time, folks, I'll see ya.